All right, it's uh, 12 o'clock on Wednesday. That means it's time for the Iowa Learning Farms Conservation Webinar. I'm Matt Helmers at Iowa State University and uh, look forward to moderating this uh, webinar with Gabe Johnson. And uh, just uh, kind of as I pointed out last week, uh, 2024 starts a 20 year celebration for the Iowa Learning Farms. So excited uh, for that and be on the lookout for various uh, special events that'll be happening uh, this year. And we'll make sure that uh, we keep everybody updated uh, about that. Really fortunate to have with us today, Gabe Johnson. Gabe is a graduate research assistant here at Iowa State University. Uh, he's doing work on uh, saturated buffers. And so his talk is going to be managing saturated buffers in a flat field, impacts on flow and nitrate load treatment, so really important topic and really important as we see more and more saturated buffers going in across across the state and really across the region. Uh, as always, if you have questions for Gabe, uh, feel free to type those into the chat box and we will get those to him at the end of his talk. With that, Gabe, the virtual floor is all yours. All right, well, thanks for the introduction, Matt. Um... Yeah, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so this topic is kind of an important um, next step here as we continue researching saturated buffers uh, for improving water quality. And uh, I'll just get us all started with a little background. I think most of us who attend these webinars regularly um, kind of know the, the background for this, but we'll get us on the same page we know that we have water quality challenges from agriculture here in Iowa, um, across the Midwest, and a lot of that is due to our subsurface tile drainage. Um, widespread across Iowa, especially, especially central Iowa, in the Des Moines Lobe area, um, and of course, that leads to issues with uh, nitrate export into our waterways, um, which leads to local drinking water quality issues, um, such as in Des Moines. And then also bigger picture downstream Gulf of Mexico hypoxia um, and those sorts of issues. And so we've developed various practices to try to uh, deal with these problems. And saturated buffers are one of those edge of field practices that we can use to try to remove that nitrate before it enters the stream. Um, so what the saturated buffer diverts that subsurface drainage from the crop fields through a vegetated stream buffer and does that with a control box that you can see in the diagram here. And so then we get that water in contact with our high carbon soils, with plant roots, and we get denitrification by microbes in that saturated, um, those saturated soils. And then we can also get plant uptake of that nitrate. Um, and so we know that when saturated buffers are properly designed and sited, that they are effective. And so a recent uh, literature review that, that we did looking across the published studies, which had 47 site years in five different states around the Midwest, the average nitrate nitrogen removal was around 46%. Um, you can see there's a large um, standard deviation, 24% kind of representing that um, different site designs across that. Um, and then when we put that in terms of uh, the load or the, the yield that we can get out, the field, it removes around 9.4 kilograms per hectare on average. Um, so we know they work well. And then we also know, especially of that water that we can get in contact with the soils, um, that we can remove a lot of that nitrate. And that's where that within buffer percentage is. So these systems don't treat all of the water, but of the water we do treat, we see a really high removal. And so since we can't treat all of the water, that's where that, that lower 46% comes from. But we know they're effective when they're properly designed, when they're properly sited. Um, these numbers are on par with what we see for other edge of field practices. Um, but we know there's limitations. As I just said, um, these practices don't treat all of the drainage. Edge of field practices on the whole and saturated buffers as part of that are really designed to treat um, only a fraction of that total annual drainage flow. And that's because we're, we're, um, we design these systems so that high flows can still bypass um, to not back up water into the field, which is really important for our crop, uh, crop production. Um, and so 
That's why sites that are flatter, the topic of, of this talk today, require more management to prevent some of those potential impacts to crops. Um, if we want to install a saturated buffer in a site that's flatter, we're going to need additional management of the stop logs to adjust the water levels um, throughout the growing season. So what do I mean um, by, by the flatter sites and, and those limitations? Well, um, this is a profile view diagram of two different saturated buffers in two different landscape positions. So the diagram on the top, you can see here this field is flat. And then the diagram on the bottom, that is the field that is sloping away um, from the buffer and from the creek with the creek being on the right. Uh, so in this diagram, the flow would be moving out of the field from the left to the right, and then we can intercept it with that control structure. So what we can see here, when we raise that water table in the control structure for the saturated buffer, in that flatter field, we can have a, a greater impact um, from that elevated water table, right? It's closer to the, to the root zone, um, and so there's potential for more impacts as opposed to a field such as on the bottom where we see that slope um, sloping up and away um, from the creek and from the buffer. There's and that water table stays at that level where we set it at the control structure. And as you go back up into the field, it's a farther, um, it's farther below the root zone. And so there's less of a chance to impact the crops um, in, a, in, a, um, in a site like that. So when we're looking at siting saturated buffers, this site on the bottom, um, a site like this is really more of an ideal site because we don't have to worry about those impacts to crops. Um, one of the phrases we like to use with, um, with thinking about the stop log management for a site like this is, hey, let's find a site where we can just set those stop logs and, for and forget about them. We don't have to worry about managing them um, because that's an additional um, um, sort of labor task for the farmer. Um, and, and that has to be done if you need to manage those stop logs. Uh, but we know that there are sites out there where it's flatter, um, where, we, where, where it would otherwise be a good site for saturated buffer with the soils um, and where we have tile drainage. And so that's where, where this study comes into play, looking at how can we make these work in those flatter sites um, better. And so when we get into that point, as I talk about stop log management, what I'm really talking about is controlled drainage. And so um, a saturated buffer really functions as controlled drainage with that extra sort of, if you want to think about it in that way, that extra um, saturated buffer component with the distribution line to channel some of that water into the buffer. Um, controlled drainage is... Um, really has many of the same components as a saturated buffer. You put in that control structure um, at the edge of the field, intercepting that tile outlet, and then you can um, set the stop logs to raise the, um, the outlet level and adjust where that water table sits. And so controlled drainage is especially effective as a, a nutrient management practice in flatter locations because we can hold that water back into the field during the non-growing season um, or even later in the summer, if we need to hold, put some water back in um, and hold that up for the crops. And so um, this, this com combination of the saturated buffer and drainage water management is what we're getting at when we manage a saturated buffer um, for um, those stop logs to, to adjust those water level settings um, throughout the year. So that gives us kind of the motivation for this study uh, we know that those sites with the flatter topography are a little bit more poorly suited for the saturated buffers due to the potential impacts from that elevated water table um, in or near the, near the, near the field. Um, and, and so, you know, moving from that, uh, the batch and build projects here in Iowa, when they are looking at siting a saturated buffer or a denitrifying bioreactor and looking at, hey, if we, if we um, raise this, this um, outlet elevation, what impact do we have in the field? They look at something called sort of the impact area or an impact zone, and that's what we're thinking about with these flat sites. And so, as I said, these flatter sites can be used, but they require more management of the stop logs. You need to um, um, manage it like a controlled drainage system where you have those stop logs closed um, during the non-growing season, but then you open them up if you need to drain that water out to get in for field operations, or to protect the, the crop growth um, during wetter periods. 
So the study site uh, that we have for this uh, project is uh, the Tesla farm. And I'm sure um, many who have watched these webinars or done field days with Iowa Learning Farms um, have been to an event here on Lee's farm. So this is Lee Testel in Polk County. Um, and so there were three new saturated buffers installed here in 2021 as part of the Polk County batch and build uh, first edition. And so um, today I'll just be focusing on one of these um, saturated buffers to kind of keep things a little bit simpler. Um, the, the, the other two are connected and, and have a little bit more complications um, with, their, with their flow um, uh, design. But so this one on the left, we call it LT5 um, on the west side of the creek here. Um, it's got about a 12 inch main tile coming into it. And then the distribution pipe length is 830 feet. And then it drains around 15 acres or six hectares um, based upon what we can estimate on the, on the topography and what Lee knows of the, the drainage systems on the farm. And then the width is around 75 feet or 23 meters. Um, the other thing I noted here on this diagram, uh, these, these stars in the next couple of slides, I've got some pictures. And so this is to help orient you with the, with the site. So, and then the first picture we're going to look at is right here, uh, this, this first star. So this site really is a great location for this study. Um, this picture is looking downstream uh, from a little bridge across the creek. And you can see on the left, Here's the control box for the, the LT2 uh, buffer on the east side of the creek. And this is during a higher flow event. The creek is near the top of the bank. And then when we look at our next picture, just a little bit farther into the field from there, in this picture, the control box for LT2 is right around here on the right side. And then this is looking down along the edge of the creek. You can see it gets wet um, in the field and in the buffer. Um, during some of these um, higher flow events in the creek and some of the heavier precipitation events. And you can see how flat uh, the field is as we especially close to the buffer. And so this is, um, this is it really is a great location. It, it gets wet in the field here. And we, we do need to manage uh, the buffer and manage those stop logs to prevent impacts to the crops. And then the next picture to help orient you. So this is from, we'll go back one. This is from this location right here um, near this big bend in the creek. And this is looking upstream. And so the flow is moving down kind of into the page to the left. And so here on the left is the monitoring wells for the LT5 buffer. And then here's that control box for LT3. Um, you can see the flat topography, flat topography here on the east side. And then once again, um, on this uh, northwest side as well as we look this way. Um, you can see where that creek level is compared to the buffer. This is during a similar high flow event. Um, and so um, once again, this is a good site to, to look at um, a study like this. So how do we monitor um, these systems? Well, we have um, a different monitoring system to do this project. And, and, and that's what led us to, to working on this. So we use the AgriDrain Smart Drainage System. Um, and so what this does, this has power actuated stop log valves that we can control remotely um, through a web dashboard. And then we have radar sensors to monitor uh, water level and help us calculate flow in the control structure. And so this is in contrast to a lot of our um, traditional monitoring or the monitoring that we've done in the past for saturated buffers or, or other edge of field practices. Um, in the past and for most installations, you have just the standard manual stop logs that you have to adjust by hand. Um, but so this system allows us to either remotely control those stop logs and move them up and down and, and change those water level settings um, from a computer or from our phone remotely, or we can use a switch and do it on site. Um, so a cool new system that, that we are, are, are partnering on to, to do this research. And so, as I said, we have the radar sensors in the control boxes, and we use a stage discharge equation and a calibration to calculate flow from those water levels. And then the other important uh, component of this is then we have an orifice flow equation to calculate flow when we have those stop log valves open. Um, so I'll back up one slide here. 
and talk a little bit more about these valves. So in a standard um, control box installation for saturated buffer or other edge field practices, um, you would just have um, a combination of these five and seven inch stop logs that get stacked in and then they can you can pull those out and, and put different ones in to change where you set that water level at. Uh, with this system, there are these valves, as I mentioned, and so these actuators can move those valves up and down and set those water levels to different settings. So for the LT5 system that we're studying here, we have three uh, different water level settings. One we call the fallow season setting, where it holds that water up as high as it can, and that's about um, a foot below the surface um, for that upper chamber. And then there's the growing season setting, if you can open, when you can open this top valve. And then there's a full drainage setting where both of these valves, um, where those valves are both open, and then all of that water can drain and, and bypass. So uh, we calculate flow, and then we monitor nitrate concentration coming out of the tile, and then in our mon monitoring wells in the buffer. And we do this on a weekly or biweekly basis. In terms of our management, so this is really the key. In 2022, we opened those stop logs for one month um, from April 20th to May 20th um, during the planting season that year um, when they needed to get into the field to plant. Um, and so um, this um, stop logs open, that's what I mean by that is we had um, both of these valves open, we had it set to that full drainage setting so all of the water could bypass and the field could drain. And then in contrast, we had um, a different management in 2023. We left the stop logs closed for the entire drainage season. Uh, the reason for this uh, was twofold. Number one, we had drier spring weather um, this past year, especially in April. And then the farmer and uh, the landowner and his um, tenant also chose different cropping management for this past spring where they didn't need to get into the field during that time period. And so we didn't need to have those stop logs uh, open because there, there wasn't a need to, to get into the field. And so then what are we looking for as we um, look at the performance of these sites? Well, the, the few key parameters that I'll be highlighting are what is that fraction of that total flow that we treated? What is the fraction of the nitrate load that we removed? Um, and then what is the fraction of that total flow that we bypassed during that full drainage period uh, when the stop logs are open? And then, of course, what is that actual mass of nitrate um, that this system has removed? And, and so with this study on this flat site and, and the controlled drainage aspect, this fraction of the total flow that we bypassed during that full drainage period is, is, is key. All right, so this is going to be a big slide with results here, and we'll really just um, kind of start with the with the big points. And so, uh, the graph, um, the two graphs on the left show the flow rates throughout the year in the top panel, panel A, and then the bottom panel B is the cumulative flow volumes uh, that we measured throughout the year, with 2022 on the top, and then 2023 on the bottom. Uh, you can see here. Um, in the top panel, the full drainage period for 2022 with how high those flow rates were during that time period. Um, and then in contrast to what we saw in 2023 with much less flow in the spring during a similar, uh, similar time period. And so part of that was driven, as I mentioned, by differences in precipitation throughout the year. Um, total precipitation was similar between both years. Um, in this area with around 800 millimeters in 2022 and around 718 in 2023. Um, but when that precipitation occurred was different, and we'll get to that on the next slide. Um, and so then this resulted in differences in total inflow volume that we measured draining out of the field um, with quite a bit greater volume in 2022, 12,000 cubic meters compared to about 7,500 cubic meters. And I'll just add, I didn't put this in terms of the uh, drainage volume with uh, millimeters because the, the drainage area that we have is, is we, we don't know quite how accurate it is. We have a good estimate, but it's not perfect. Um, so that, that'll be the next step on that. Um, and then here, one other thing I wanted to point out with the 2023 
um, the stop logs. I adjusted the stop logs to this fallow season setting in in early March. Um, they'd been left at that growing season setting and at the end of 2022, and I didn't adjust them until early in May or early in March, excuse me. And so you can see that big increase in how much um, treated flow we had during that time. So we look at the total treated flow, um, driven in part by the differences in precip and um, total flow volume. We treated more flow in 2022 compared to 2023. And then we had a higher, but we ended up with treating a higher percentage still in 2022 compared to 2023. And then some of our other summary numbers for the site, um, we had more nitrate um, drained from the field in 2022 compared to 23, 77 kilograms compared to about 34. And then we removed 42 kilograms in 22 compared to about 14 in 2023. And those combined for uh, resulted in around a 55% edge of field treatment percentage, and then a 40 in 2022 and 41% in 2023. Um, part of the differences in that nitrate load um, between the two years were driven by the differences in flow drained out of the field, but then also a, a slight difference in concentration um, between the two years with with a higher uh, flow weighted average nitrate concentration with around 6.7 milligrams per liter in 2022 compared to about 4.4 .4 in 2023. And then the last thing, well, what happened during this full drainage period? Well, that accounted for 25% of the total annual drainage flow. Um, so of our total flow that we measured in 2022, 25% occurred um, during this full drainage period and we, by and so, and we bypassed all of that. Um, Compared to 23, stop logs were closed the whole time, and so we didn't have any flow um, bypass during the full drainage period. Um, so that's that's the really big um, observation we've made so far with this, is that during that full drainage period, that can account for a large fraction of the annual drainage flow, especially since um, that's going to be during these, these spring months where we have less evapotranspiration, the crops aren't in yet, and so we know a lot of that precip that we have has to run off or has to drain um, during those time periods. So we'll go into some of the data um, behind this a little bit more. Here's the precipitation um, at the site. You can see a wetter spring in 2022 compared to 23. As I mentioned, uh, these red bars in the graph are April, May, and then even June in that uh, late spring to early summer period. Um, and so that was um, likely driving those differences we saw in flow during those uh, during those months between the two years. So then when we zoom in a little bit more and look at these two years individually, um, my next question was, well, we bypassed a large fraction of that annual flow in 2022, but we still had a pretty high treatment percentage, right? Around We treated around 66% of that total flow. Um, and then that resulted in that 55% edge of field reduction. Well, what really happened here um, was what we saw was that during those events later in the summer, we really had minimal bypass flow um, with the saturated buffer treating nearly all of the flow during those events later in into um, June and then July. And so that's that's really, really um, interesting. You can see those um, that shown here in this graph um, with that uh, bypass flow spiking uh, with the inflow during those events, but then going back down and that treated flow in blue matching the inflow. So you can't see the inflow underneath the treated flow right there. But when we look at the cumulative flow, it really increased similarly with our inflow. So we treated a lot of that, that flow during those events. When we look at that same time period in 2023, we had a few events um, pretty similar in June and July, but we had more bypass flow during those times. Um, you can see just how much that bypass flow would, would jump up, that, that total bypass flow as it accumulated throughout the season during those events with smaller increases in the treated flow during that time. Um, so I'm still trying to you know, figure out why that may occur. Um, we have data for groundwater level 
and the buffer from our wells. And so that's my next step with this is we'll put that together and look at what's going on with the groundwater level um, within the buffer and see you know what could be driving some of these differences. And the other thing I'll point out again here is when we when I adjusted those stop logs to that fallow season setting, um, we had that that large increase in how much flow we treated as that buffer filled up to that additional capacity um, during that time in in uh, in early March. So then a few more graphs um, before I, I wrap this up. Um, when we look at that full drainage season in a little more detail in 2022, uh, we we can see some of these large spikes in in the flow during those times, and it looks like the flow wasn't consistent, but we had really high flow rates. Uh, this is driven by um, the precipitation we had during those times, and and this orifice flow equation. Uh, to calculate the flow during that time, we used the orifice equation, but we needed um, a difference in head between the different chambers of the control structure. Um, but we had some really large events and that, that made it challenging to calculate that. And so there were times where the water level in the control box was just at the same level um, during that period. And so we couldn't calculate flow because there was no difference in those water levels. And you can see that here in this graph, this is showing the water levels during that same time period in the three different chambers of the control structure. So we have the upper chamber where the water comes in, the middle chamber, and then that third chamber as it then exits out in the creek. And so we had um, some heavy precipitation events and the water levels in all three chambers pretty much matched with the creek backing up. Um, the creek would back up into that third chamber and you can see how those water levels really tracked closely together uh, during that time. And then just a couple more things here. When, when we look at concentration, um, we saw what we want to see with a saturated buffer. So that's a good sign, um, just, what, just what we wanted. Within the buffer, we saw low concentrations uh, in that yellow and gray line on the bottom. And then compared to our inlet concentrations in this blue line, and then both of those were lower than the creek. And this is pretty consistent throughout both years. And then when we look at that in this bar graph, we can see that concentration being reduced from the tile into the wells closer to the field and then closer to the stream as well. So in that aspect, the buffer is functioning well, and we're having really high removal of that water that we're treating uh, that gets into the buffer. So wrapping this up, there's a lot of numbers on this table, um, but I'm going to highlight a couple of them here. And so here's really this the big takeaway. As I, as I had earlier, we bypassed 25% of the total annual drainage flow during that full drainage period um, in 2022. And then when we look at that as a fraction of the total bypass flow throughout the year, that accounted for 60% of the bypass flow. Um, so this is really important to say, during the rest of the year, and with that drainage period really only being less than six months, um, we were... Um, for, it was only 40% of the, of, the, of the bypass flow um, during the rest of the year with 60% of it accounted for it during that full drainage period. Um, and then, you know, what does that come out to in our total annual nitrate load? Well, based on the concentrations, it was pretty similar to, the, um, to matching how much flow we diverted, but a little bit higher. And so we, we bypassed about 28% of our total annual nitrate load uh, during that full drainage period. Um, but importantly, we know that we still treated a lot of nitrate um, and were had an effectiveness similar to other sites. And so it's important to see that it looks like the site, despite having it open for that full drainage period, we were still removing nitrate during those other periods and it was still effective on the whole. So, um, wrapping this up, kind of the, the key takeaways and conclusions uh, so far and, and where we're heading next, uh, we know that a large fraction of that annual drainage flow and the nitrate load can occur during those full drainage periods. As I said earlier, um, oftentimes these, these full drainage periods when we need to open the stop logs uh, to allow field access for planting is going to be in those spring months, April, May, when we often have a lot of precipitation and a lot of drainage uh, due to lack of, of crop 
prop use of water, lack, uh, lack of evapotranspiration compared to other times during the year. And so this is, uh, this is really important. But on the whole, saturated buffers that are located in these flatter fields, um, as I said, they may require that additional management on the stop logs to prevent the adverse impacts to crops. Um, but so far, it looks like they can still be effective for nitrate load reduction, even when we have them open for some of those full drainage periods. Um, so this data is still kind of early on. We only have these two uh, years so far, and so some additional years um, as we, we're going to keep monitoring this year and will help us better inform these results and management decisions um, and under, and it'll be important too if we can get some uh, different precipitation patterns this year, especially if we can get some precipitation and have drainage flow for this study um, as we saw those different patterns in 2022 and 2023. Um, so with that, um, we'll take questions, and I'll just acknowledge that this was this this works really a, a big partnership, um, and it's funded by a conservation innovation grant, which is um, funding my research here, and then um, it, it's also partnering with the Iowa Soybean Association, and as I mentioned, um, AgriGrain and Ecosystem Services Exchange have been collaborating on this those smart drainage systems. Okay, do you have a couple other slides, Gabe, that I can? Okay, yes, if you need a uh, CCA CEU and you're on today, please email Elena Whitaker, A-L-E-N-A-W at iState.edu by five o'clock today and include your name, the name you entered to watch the webinar and your CCA number. Again, Elena Whitaker, A-L-E-N-A-W at iState.edu by five o'clock today. Um, let's go to the next slide, which should be, if you're willing to submit a, a voluntary demographic survey, you can scan that QR code, or you can go to iwillearningfarms.org slash survey. Uh, only one response uh, is needed for 2024 webinars. So if you were on um, uh, last uh, week, and did this, thank you very much. You don't need to do it again, but if this is your first webinar of 2024, uh, if you would um, go and, and fill out that voluntary demographic survey, we would greatly appreciate it. Again, you can scan the QR code or go to iowalearningfarms.org slash survey and put in a plug for next week's webinar. We have uh, Crystal Liu that's gonna talk about uh, tile drainage uh, decision support tool developed to manage ag land and reduce nitrogen pollution. So um, gonna be, I think, an a, a interesting topic, a little different topic, but interesting topic. Okay, uh, still have time to get some questions in, but we have gotten some. And so um, the first one was, can you please explain the environmental fate of the nitrate that's uh, captured and removed in these systems? Yeah, great question. Um... So as I mentioned at the beginning uh, with that saturated buffer uh, diagram slide, uh, the primary uh, nitrate removal mechanism is denitrification. And so that converts the nitrate from that NO3 form uh, to the, the N2 nitrogen gas form that takes up around 80% of the atmosphere. And so that's where most of that nitrate um, is going. It gets converted into the, the nitrogen gas. With plant uptake, it can be, you know, um, it can be stored in the plants and eventually recycled back again. Um, but the primary mechanism is the denitrification. Um, there was one that, uh, actually two questions that kind of talked about, uh, that asked about how the pipes were installed, whether there was any special, anything special with how they were wrapped. And then have there been any issues um, at this site or other sites with roots clogging the tile uh, that might reduce the, you know, the amount of water you can get out into that saturated buffer system? That's a, that's a pretty common question we have with saturated buffers. Um, so for the installation of the pipes, no, these pipes were not wrapped. Um, so they were just installed. Um, it's the standard perforated um, tile pipe. I think these are the distribution line pipe was six inches. And so it was not wrapped um, with the root intrusion. At a lot of our other research sites, we have not seen issues yet with, with root intrusion. Um, 
this site here, um, the the buffers, the vegetation in the buffers was established in 2000. So it's been well established for over 20 years. Um, and so the, the, the vegetation is, is established. Um, I guess I'll give a little shout out. Um, Billy Beck is working on a project with trees and saturated buffers and, and looking at the potential for root intrusion. I think there's been a webinar or a virtual field day with that. Um, and so that'll be a study going on looking at, you know, um, what's the potential with trees and, and other vegetation um, for root intrusion. But we haven't seen issues with that at most sites so far. Um, it kind of a couple questions related to the same topic. So um, how did the nitrate concentrations vary uh, kind of throughout the season at this site? You know, were there higher concentrations during that period of, of full drainage uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another good question. Um, so maybe I'll go back to one of my slides. Um, the nitrate concentrations at this site, um, it was interesting. Let me go back to the slide. So at the LT5, so as I mentioned, there's, there's um, a couple of different saturated buffers on Lee's farm. Uh, this one, LT5, the concentration out of the, out of the field was really consistent throughout the year, uh, throughout both years, um, around six to seven, six to eight milligrams per liter in 2022, and then around four to six in 2023 with a slight decrease um, as you get later into the, into the summer, which we tend to see at other sites. Um, I don't have the plot for the other side, for, um, for the other um, saturated buffers, uh, but the LT2 and LT3 systems, there were... Um, there were more changes in that nitrate concentration at these two throughout the season um, with kind of a, an increase from early in the spring towards the summer and then a decrease at the end of the summer. Um, so those can be variable, um, but we saw that um, on the whole, this one for LT5 was really pretty consistent throughout the year. Okay. Um, any data available on uh, kind of in buffer nitrous oxide emissions? You know, they're wondering if you, you can, if we see a, increased uh, greenhouse gas emission or, or decrease. Uh, I think that's not really a uh, area of your work, but uh, you might have looked at uh, Morgan Davis. Did Morgan do that that yeah. work? And, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's another good question. Um, yeah. So with the denitrification process, there is potential to convert, um, to have it not complete and have some of that nitrate get converted into the nitrous oxide gas. Um, there's been one or two studies done here in Iowa um, by one of um, Tom Eisenhardt's former students, uh, Morgan Davis, who looked at some of the um, greenhouse gas emissions from saturated buffers and traditional riparian buffers. And what they found was that there were not greater, um, on the whole, the nitrous oxide emissions in the saturated buffers um, were lower than what we see out of, out of an adjacent crop field. Um, and similar to other riparian buffers. And so that's not um, a, a big concern at this time, but yeah, definitely um, an area that could still be looked at for at other sites. And just as we move forward, really, really conscious of the, the greenhouse gas and, and potential for pollutant swapping. But on the whole, um, we haven't monitored at this site, but at other sites where we've studied, we, we haven't had, we haven't seen a lot of um, any issues from that. Okay. Um... One here that uh, indicates uh, they understand that the carbon uh, is essential for the microbes to remove nitrate. Um, is that carbon in the soil finite? Uh, you know, and and I guess uh, if that's true, how many years of service can we realize with with one of these? Are we getting some of the root exudates that are adding carbon back into the the system? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, yeah, the carbon is essential for the denitrification to essentially feed the microbes and so um, but really um, it is um, replenished by the perennial vegetation and so the perennial vegetation is really key for the saturated buffers um, as those roots help um, um, provide carbon into the soil um, and some of the other work that isn't published yet but is, is ongoing here by some of our other uh, collaborators um, 
is looking has looked at what happens with the with the carbon in the soils and these different riparian buffers and saturated buffers and and has observed kind of a change in in the um, type of carbon um, and 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 is seeing that um, those plants those perennial vegetation are really crucial um, for providing carbon for the denitrification um, and I've also some of the data I've worked on when we look at um, that within buffer um, removal percentage, which I highlighted here earlier, this um, this percentage here in the red, that's driven by the perennial vegetation and the carbon in the soil. And so we, it's really high on, on the whole. And um, the other part of that question was about uh, lifespan, I think. I don't want to forget that. Yeah. Um, and so, no, we don't really, we don't expect the carbon to be um, depleted by these systems. It can be replenished by the vegetation. And so the lifespan is really limited by if there is root intrusion um, into that pipe or if the control structure fails after a long period of time. Um, but really, um, on, that, on the whole, not a lot of maintenance in terms of that aspect. If the pipe were to get clogged, you could always just install a new pipe um, right next to it or something like that. Okay. All right. I think that uh, kind of um, gets at the main questions that uh, that kind of Gabe's in a position to to answer. Oh, there is, uh, you know, kind of a, a comment. Um, uh, oh, okay. All right. Somebody did ask uh, here about root intrusion that you indicated no impact. Does that mean you've excavated any part of a mature buffer? Um, so I guess how how are you uh, estimating that? I think I think I know one way that it's been done, but um, yeah. So I haven't been involved with any sort of excavation of a mature buffer and looking at um, at the tile lines to see if there's root intrusion. Um, but we haven't observed changes in the flow that we're, that that we're diverting into the buffer that we think would be driven by by the by the roots. Um, I don't know if, and I see I don't I see Kent Hikins on I I don't know if he because I know they put in access uh, points at um, at some of the uh, at, at Bear Creek One, and I don't know mm -hmm. if that. If they've gone in and, and run a camera through that, we we have done some work um, with prairie strips where we put a camera uh, in some of the tile lines, and we have really not seen a big, um, we've not seen much uh, root intrusion into that into that system. Yeah, I, I think you're right that they may have done a, yep. a camera, yep. or but uh, yep. yeah, I, I'll have to chat with with, with Kent or for time about that. Yep. Yeah, Andy also, yeah, we ran cameras in three-year intervals and uh, Kent indicated, and then uh, uh, Andy Olson uh, with Tallgrass Prairie Center said they've ran tile cameras in the buffers and and in the same, same as in the strips that they've not seen a, a real problem there. And that Bear Creek one is so oh, 20 feet away from trees uh, and still haven't been a, a big problem there. Yeah, that's a mixed herbaceous yep. and, and woody buffer, yeah, so. Uh, all right. I think that in the interest of time, I'll thank Gabe again for, for this talk. Um, definitely tune in next week to hear uh, Crystal Liu. And if you need a CCA CEU, uh, please uh, email Elena Whitaker, A-L-E-N-A-W at iState.edu uh, by five o'clock uh, today with your name, the name you entered to watch the webinar and your CCA number. And uh, Gabe, uh, thanks again for uh, important presentation and the work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Happy to share and looking forward to additional data that we'll collect this coming year. Yeah, I think we. I think uh, I will echo your comment. I hope we get rain because we need <laughs> rain for our for our water quality work, especially our drainage. Well, yeah, any water quality work we need it. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks.